Hey everyone, I'm your host Chris Sands, and today we have a little bit of a different episode. We're going to be talking about uh, beer as usual, but also <laughs> um, about baseball. We're joined by Eno Saris, who, from what I've been told, is in in addition to having a ridiculous amount of knowledge in baseball, is also somewhat of a beer geek. Is that accurate? That's right. That's right. Uh, for a little bit, I ran a beer magazine. Um, and I had my own beer website for a while, uh, and it was super geeky. It was called Beer Graphs. It was a spinoff of Fan Graphs, and we had leaderboards for beers where you could like sort beers by beers above replacement and style plus uh, <laughs> various geeky um, things like that. So definitely a nerd. <laughs> I uh, I too briefly ran a uh, beer magazine that crashed and burned about a year ago. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I I was uh, I worked at October. I don't know if, if you all know that it was a Condé Nast magazine, but uh, yeah, helped launch that guy. Okay, yeah, they're they're still around. How long did and, you do beer graphs for? Um, uh, I think Ellen, it was like you're four- not allowed to talk yet. I haven't even introduced you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and also uh, joining us is Alan Etzler, um, one of my coworkers and uh, one of the editors at the Frederick News Post. Um, you did you ever write for Uncapped? I think you wrote some stuff. Yeah, I wrote a couple of things for Uncapped when it first started. Yeah, I loved it. So did I. I'm sad it went, but apparently advertisers didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. Alan, I think have you have you ever co-hosted? You have you been on Uncapped? Never been, before? On, never been on Uncapped. Uh, the podcast at least. I am on Uncut. Uh, when we had that and. Uh, just another sports podcast, which is our sports podcast that we did uh, before 2020 blew the world up. Um, but yeah, I think this is, I think this rounds out. I have officially been on every Frederick News Post podcast now. Congratulations. <laughs> um, Alan is here to um, help speak intelligently about baseball when Eno goes into any baseball stuff because I um, – while I was a huge fan in the nineties and into the two thousands, um, I don't follow it nearly as much as I used to. Did, did it fall off as the Orioles got worse? Uh, I've never been an Orioles fan. Oh, okay. Um, it's actually worse. I grew up in <laughs> Pittsburgh, so I'm, I'm a born and bred pirates fan. They were actually good after you stopped watching a little bit, but well, I, well, now I, they're I, bad I jumped, again. I jumped back onto the bandwagon. Oh, good. Then <laughs> when my wife and I would go back to visit, we'd go to game. We started going to games again. And then, well, yeah. now we just don't go anywhere. So it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're all in our houses. Yeah. So maybe I'll go out to Pittsburgh and watch a Blue Jays game. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they are looking for a home. Um, but before we jump into this, there's um, this is the first time that we're fully talking about this in the public i'm super excited about it um we'll all be drinking full tilt beers today because uh eno is a friend of the brewery so uh dan sent him an assortment of beers and the latest iteration of dan's jams is going to be called sans jams um amazing that is amazing and does that say cinnamon yeah, so it's like a um pi- uh, pineapple mango crisp sour. Wow. So it'll have uh, pineapple mango, cinnamon, and vanilla. That'll that'll I think that'll go either way. I have um, <laughs> I have I have full faith in Jordan, uh, the brewer there, that he's going to make an amazing beer. And at yeah, least I Jordan. really, I really hope so. Since my, <laughs> not only is my likeness, but my name is on this one too. <laughs> what was your, what was your involvement in terms of picking the, uh, the type and the, in the situation? Um, so it's actually, it was funny. It, it was born from, I was meeting up, Dan and I meet up at Dunkin' Donuts every once in a while for him to, uh, give me beer. So I don't have to drive all the way to, uh, Baltimore. Um, and he was, it was one of the times, I think it was the gummy worms. Dan's oh, jam. No, it so might have good. Been, yeah, that was a really good one. Yeah. Um, or it may have been before that one, but I was telling them like that they needed to come out with Dan's jams glassware. Oh yeah. So, so whenever um whenever he went back and told Nick, the other co-owner, and Jordan the brewer, 
um, Jordan was like, well, we got to do a collab and call it Sans Jams now. <laughs> so <laughs> then we were in an um, email chain where we came up with what the fruit was going to be. And and that's really all that there is to come up with this because all Dan's jams, well, I guess it's just jams now because there's going to be a series of other ones kind of like this. Um, it's the same base beer. And then it's just the adjuncts that change from version to version. Right, right. right. Also, uh, no banana hammock for you on this one. No, no, full, uh, full shorts. No one, no one, want, no, absolutely no one wants to see that. I probably not even my wife. Well, it's so, debatable. We wanted to see it for Dan, but uh, it was yeah. part of the part of the packaging. Uh, so the story of this is that I've kicked Dan off of his raft, and he's mad about it, and uh, wearing yeah. and wearing it's a Nickelback it. shirt. <laughs> Which which the story be, <laughs> the story behind that too is also funny is because apparently while Dan does not like Nickelback he hates Nickelback jokes so he defends them because <laughs> <laughs> because he can't stand people making fun of them. Nice. Well, now I know uh, our text our text string is about to get some Nickelback jokes, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the group chat here it comes. <laughs> so. I would say in about uh, three weeks, Sands Jams will be available, uh, Pineapple Mango Crisp Sour, and I'll, I'll, I'll point out for the first time, if you look at the can, that's actually a hint to the other Dan's Jams that'll come out at the same time. Well, you're going to have to blow that up for us then. You got to Yeah, zoom. I don't... Well, actually, can I? Yeah. Well, that's about as big as it'll get. <laughs> Not much bigger. <laughs> Um, uh, wow, but, that has like a unicorn on it. Yes, it does. It, the the raft <laughs> is a unicorn in that Good one. Eye. <laughs> Good eye. <laughs> Can't see anything. All right, so I guess we can get that's back fun. To it. I, uh, I I can't. I, I'm gonna make him send one of those too. I'm sure he will. Well, I like I've already like I you know a couple of these. I was like I've got the uh, banana hammock here, which he is wearing. Uh, yeah. banana hammock, as you can see. <laughs> Um, and, uh, that one already banana cinnamon vanilla. I was like, Whoa, did you try so that I yet? Guess, no, I, it's, it's, uh, here if we it, want to, it tastes like a banana cream pie. Ah, it, it, it you know, it, you know, the funny thing about cinnamon is it doesn't always read as cinnamon, right? It doesn't, it like, yeah, it, it's almost it has like, a, it has like a wide range of how it yeah. presents itself. Like chili in a beer. Like I had this terrible, terrible beer once called like chili cave beer or something. With like, it was like a lager with like a chili in it. Yeah. And it just, I don't. I don't like those. It just tasted like a the hot, like you know, it's just like spicy. It's gross. But um, I don't know if you've had perennials. Um, what's their birthday? Sa- the the um, ha- happy birthday. I don't think um, they're available here. Are they? Oh, uh, okay. well. Uh, you've you've well, had a, you. You've had like a stout with chili in it where yeah. you didn't read as chili as much as like a, just a little bit of like crisp or like bitterness at the end. It kind of just like kind of uh, cleaned it up, cleaned up the taste as opposed to like reading as like chili in your face. Like you've had that. Uh, you've had yeah. chili stouts. Yeah, where, definitely had. Yeah. Like I, I like chili in some stouts, but like I can't say that I love chili across the board. And I think cinnamon's kind of a similar thing. The, um, now Ballast Point makes a lot of gross, uh, beer with, <laughs> with chilies <laughs> and spice and different things in it. <laughs> yeah. So, the, the Victory at Sea kind of, uh, like the little plays on Victory at Sea. They have different yeah. Victory at Seas. Yeah. Not, not all amazing. Yeah. I would definitely say less than amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one, uh, what kicked off, uh, me wanting to talk to you was that Dan had shared the article you wrote about um, uh, the beer prospects for every major league baseball city. And mm-hmm. I thought that was really cool one. Cause um, it, I, there's only a few cities that I, I have any knowledge really of what it were. And you pretty much, I, I was probably about 80% right on exactly what I thought you were going to pick for each city. Cool. Um, and Alan, did you? I I did not give you much time. Did you happen to read no, that? No, I, I read the. Um, so I've read the uh, grocery store beer 
bracket because I needed to see what was what was going to be picked. Mm -hmm. um, because I generally don't like anything in grocery stores, and we don't even really have beer in grocery stores in Maryland. Um, I wanted that to be like easily accessible, like yeah. like you know, like uh, flagship brands. Like you know, I wanted to try and get Miller Light drinkers on the same page <laughs> with. Uh, craft beer drinkers, but of course the craft beer drinkers won out in the end. <laughs> yeah. You did pick the right one. Um, and I saw the uh, beer nerds guide to every ballpark. And then I saw the Baltimore Orioles entry on the prospects. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I can't remember uh, who this, who, like I mentioned, I mentioned in the blurb other than uh, I ended up giving full tilt a prospect. I think that with uh, Jordan, uh, at the helm, uh, they've taken a real uh, uh, leap forward in the beer department. Uh, the 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 gummy worms was a relevant revelation for me. I've always liked Hops a Cat, but um, I think their hazy beers have gotten better under Jordan. Um, and so, uh, and then I think I picked Union. Was it Union? Yeah. As the, yeah, yeah, Union was the uh, can't miss. Yeah, because like you know, I think it's can't can't. I, I, I came <laughs> to town and, and drank with everybody. They showed me their spot uh, that they were building. Full Tilt was building. And then we went to Union. <laughs> like you know, later on we we hit some some um, some spots down uh, by the water. But like you know, when we went one place, it was like it was going to be Union. So and, and Duck Pin is is kind of like a flagship for the region, I think. Yeah. Um. And and but it, it's not only Duck Pin. It's not like they just like do Duck Pin. That's it. So, um. You know, I, I forget who I who I I mentioned. I tried to in the prospects mention like three or four places that were interesting, but it's kind of hard staying on top of things. And so a lot of times I have to like, you know, contact people in the region. I have I have come with like beer scouts of my own that I'm yeah. like, oh, what do you what yeah. are you like drinking right now? So, um. Well, you you even you nailed the nationals. Um. I mean, Blue Jackets the obvious pick with in walking distance of the stadium. Um. But the the mention of Ocelot, that's one of the best breweries in the Northern Virginia area. I love that place. Um, and then your your uh, Pittsburgh picks were spot on too with Dancing Gnome, um, Grist House. Wait, was it Grist House? I think so. I might have mentioned yeah. Cinderlands too. And then Cinderlands was the um, the top prospect. prospect. Yeah, 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 yeah. All three amazing Pittsburgh breweries. So. so so I, I'll take that as a compliment. You know, uh, there are uh, obviously there's some misses. And you know what was actually the hardest was in some of the more established markets, picking a prospect. Like if you think about New York, everyone knows about other half. Everyone knows about Grimm. Uh, everyone almost knows about all the good places. Like there isn't hasn't been like there isn't really a prospect in New York where people are like, ooh, there's this. Yeah. Place. Because as soon as you're a place that like people are excited about. There's like a million, there's so, yeah. so many people in New York. It's like, it's going to get blown up, you know? I, I was going to ask you how you determined what was like a prospect versus, you know, what, what we would all consider to be like an everyday starter in the major leagues. Like, what is the size? How are you kind of determining it that? Was a little bit on name value, I guess. Yeah. And just like, you know, if I said this name to you, like how likely are you to know it? Like if you tell us, if you say Blue Jacket, like yeah, people, I think people know Blue Jacket, but like if you're talking about Aslan and Ocelot and stuff, like that's sort of, you have to be from the region and kind of, you know, have been there or or drank some of their beers to kind of know about it. So that's, so uh, I, that was the with, difference. So like I, I didn't, so because I didn't see the whole article, um, who did you pick for Boston and was Trillium a pick? I did not actually. Um, I picked Night Shift, uh, but I discussed Trillium. So it was uh, uh, Night Shift or Trillium were like the can't miss. Uh, and yeah. I was like, most people would say Trillium, but for me, it's me at Night Shift because I love Whirlpool uh, IPA. Is an IPA they make. I think it's one of my favorite beers ever. Um, and uh, I think they have a little bit more range maybe than Trillium. Trillium's about the hazies. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Night Shift has... Uh, Although have you had array. have you ever had any Trillium's dark beers? I've had one or two. Yeah, the uh, first the first well, Trillium I ever had them, was I think when they were smaller. Porter, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Somehow, and it was it was it was actually really good. And I'm not a huge fan of porters, which is also kind of why I'm I'm surprised. Like uh, the s'mores what that we're drinking, which I can't. So the beauty of this camera is that it's really good at focusing oh, on faces. Yeah. But if you so hold you something right else up, <laughs> there we go. If I put it right in plane with my face, <laughs> um, this more is what is ridiculously good. It is very good. It's very toasty. I like I like the toastiness to it. Yes. Yeah, so, last night, They're almost like a a berryish part to it. 
last night um i was in a text conversation with jordan and uh dan and nick and they sent a screenshot of a review um that said that it it tasted like burnt marshmallow (laughs) they're like well moron you're kind of supposed to burn the marshmallows (laughs) like that's how you make it more the best tasting (laughs) that is that is what it's supposed to taste like you're right you nailed it you got it (laughs) it it is congratulations a plus for me though (laughs) what's that it is like slightly too hot out for these these dark kind of toasty these are like cold weather beers to me well, I'm in my basement and it's a good five degrees colder down here than the rest of the house. So it's, <laughs> it feels closer to winter right now. Um, yeah, let me so, see. I'm trying to find out where my prospect was for the Red Sox. Hold on. Trillium holds a very special place in my heart because it's the, it's the first brewery that I spent more than $20 for a four pack at. And now it's just <laughs> kind of become the norm. Yeah. So that's, that's kind right. of what I, that's what I think makes Treehouse better. Treehouse has amazing beer and it's cheaper. It's not ridiculously it's almost expensive. like the in and out versus five guys conversation yeah. where you're like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. get out of there for nine bucks. Five guys, it's like 20 bucks to get out of there. They almost don't, you can't almost compare them. Yeah, my, then, uh, my prospect for, for them was a notch or channel marker. So. Very cool. I was also I I was curious what you were going to do with San Diego. Um, and I, it, it's there. been a while since I've been to San Diego and I didn't know any of those breweries. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Pure, pure project is, is the best new stuff in San Diego. I, I have, uh, in-laws there, so, um, uh, we go there fairly often. Um, because yeah, I, great I, city. I, oh, I loved it there so much. I went to, well, I've been a couple times. My wife's cousins live in San Diego um, one lives in San Diego County and one lives out in Marietta, which Temecula has some of the best breweries in the world. Mm. Um, but Who's I went there? to a, what's that? Who's out in Temecula? Um, I cannot remember the names of any uh, of them. Uh, Lone, uh, Lone Star, mm. I think was one of, one of the ones I really enjoyed. It's also um, known for its wines for what it's worth. Yeah. So, well, that what I, from what I was told was that they were trying to kind of kind of piggyback onto the wine notoriety of the area, and like there was a ton of breweries all building up in this one industrial park. But then yeah. I went to I went to a conference that was at that hotel that's connected to um, the Padre Stadium. And yeah, so I walked around to all the breweries within walking distance. Half, half Door was there. Monkey Paw. Yeah. There was yeah. I went to Monkey by. Paw. That place was awesome. What a little yeah. dive, but with amazing beer. They got ruined by acquisition a little bit. Who bought I them? I forget who bought them. Uh, Ballast Point? No, I forget who bought them. Somebody bought them and wasn't quite the same after. And I think they might even shut down now after all this. But the one thing that's really cool cool about san diego to to me is that like no matter what wave you you think about uh with craft beer they were amazing right like they were amazing in the first wave like like we were we're clowning on ballast point a little bit and that's fine like they're not what they used to be but ballast point and like ale smith uh i love ale smith in in stone were like first waivers right and yeah. so you're like, oh, okay. So maybe they're maybe San Diego is just old school. Well, no. In the second way, they had like society, uh, abnormal. Uh, they uh, uh, oh, pizza port. Like they had good second waivers. And then you're like, okay, well, maybe they're not on top of stuff now. And then you go and you're like, oh crap, pure project half door. Like they like they 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 just value beer so much that like there's always somebody pushing to come to the top. You know, like it, it it's not at all like uh, you know resting on its laurels or like if you think about new york there's no tradition in new york there's only new right you only have yeah. other half and grim and stuff and it's like no if you think like first wave beer la what well, the problem with la is like they didn't have first wave they barely had second wave it was like golden road and yeah. uh <laughs> you know and like they're getting there now with like monkish and some other stuff but like uh, i don't know why it is necessarily because you know they're not that different from NoCal, but like up here in in North California, like we I think we've done our decent job like keeping up with each wave. Would that, um, so for but, New York, would you consider like Brooklyn and Six Point 
is maybe yeah, the first wave. I would maybe. say almost second wave. Like, I, like I have to think about exactly when Brooklyn was founded, but like it's not back in 1997. Like, in, yeah, it's in not Macri. that bad. Actually, so probably in my mind, what I'm considering first wave is actually what you're considering second, second wave. wave yeah, because the first wave Mar- is like Sam Adams and yeah. Stone, like 97. You know? And Mar- <laughs> Maryland is was way behind in yeah. beer for so long because of the laws and it was really hard to operate. So like our waves are not in sync with, right, right. with the yeah. national ones. And the laws are a big deal. Like Georgia still, you can't like, uh, you can't really have like a brewery tap room in Georgia. Like still, it's there's insane. like, come, come on, dude. <laughs> like everyone else is doing it. Like, can't you figure this out? You know, they did in California with the coronavirus. I don't know if this is true for y'all. I think it is shipping. They just said, you know what? Yeah, uh, we, want we these finally places that to survive. <clears throat> you can ship directly from the brewery, and but that uh, apparently has not gone to every state. You know, it's definitely not true in Georgia. <laughs> but I y- think y'all do shipping, right? I yes, only within state. It has to be yeah, a Maryland brewery yeah. to a Maryland consumer. Um, mm-hmm. That was a second round of loosening. At first, yeah. it was just they allowed home delivery. So breweries right. could deliver to your house directly right off the bat. I don't know. I, I would I would be okay with that not going away. Because and I would say this too, like I understand that there's a job for like a beer tender, like a like y'all do y'all have like a like a you have like a beer man, like like you have like a local store and there's like a guy who like holds oh, beer yeah. for you. Yeah. You know, they're like, Oh, I got this for you. I put this in the back for you, you know? Yeah, the, uh, that guy that when you walk in, as soon as you walk in, he's like, hey, I got something you're going to like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That relationship, I don't think will go away. And I don't think that like, like I went back to my, I can get delivery all over California, but I went back to my beer store when it opened, you know, because I saw my beer guy, he had something for me. We talked about stuff we've had, you know, and I could get like a four pack here and a one, a single over here and like, you know, make up my own thing. Whereas like when, when it, the one drawback of delivery is like, you might have to get like 24 of your favorite beer. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's the way, that's the way it was in Pennsylvania for the longest time. You can only buy cases of beer. Yeah. It's like, ah, yeah. I mean, I like, I like some beers that much, but there's like three beer, beers beer I want 24 of. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're going to, so we're going to take a real quick, uh, break to thank our sponsors. And then we get back. I want to talk about, um, your opinions on what the best, uh, ballparks in the country are for craft beer. So we will be right back. If you haven't heard about our beer dinners, well, now you have typically the last Tuesday of each month, we partner with a local brewery and craft an exclusive five course dinner. Each course is thoughtfully paired with some of the finest craft beer available. You'll meet the brewery, enjoy memorable pairings and service, and have a damn good time. Like us on Facebook to stay in the know when tickets become available, because they will sell out quick. Idiom Brewing Company proudly offers a delicious variety of beers to satisfy the most discerning taste. Best known for their wide array of IPAs, delicious fruited sours, and robust porters and stouts. Idiom prides themselves on continuing to innovate, utilizing new and experimental hops, local ingredients, and unique flavor profiles. Idiom has a simple goal in mind, to bring people from all walks of life together to enjoy themselves and each other. Idiom Brewing Company is located in downtown Frederick, just south of, south of the intersection of East Street and East Patrick Street, with ample seating and directly on Carroll Creek. All right, so it seems like um, at least in every stadium I've been to, including our local minor league one, that probably is not going to be around much longer. RIP. Yeah, you need to you need to do the craft beer of minor league stadiums articles before uh, before we lose. Some are really good, right? Was the beer at that place good? It, they, they they just amped it way up. Uh, starting last year, they had a. Um, I guess they were calling it a, a, a I can't remember what the name of it was, but it was focused on local Maryland craft beer. They had like at least in the teens of taps and it was all local beer. Yeah. I, I love that. And, and if you go, uh, you know, pretty much the most well-known minor league stadium in the country is going to be Durham. And when I was there, they had a, a tap room in the stadium or a brewery in the stadium. Oh, you cool. just, I think the concourse. 
Yeah, I think, you know, and also I, I think that like their uh, minor league parks are leaders uh, are in front of what major league parks are doing in a lot of ways. Like, uh, yes. the, 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 the Fredericksburg was the one that had um, that really cool food uh, thing with like the Voltaggio brothers. Yes. Well, Frederick, that, don't add the huh? Bergs to us. We're just oh, Frederick. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, they did. They had. Yeah. That was the stadium that had the Voltaggio in it, right? Yeah. And I, I think the point is. I have is the bobblehead like, from it. <laughs> the point is, there's a Voltaggio bobblehead. Yeah, the, the, when cool. they had the Voltaggio night, they, the first uh, however many like with, like, uh, people. It, it like just, it was like. <laughs> no, it was just like, you know, uh, the body with a bobblehead. It did not look like uh, him either. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> it's it's a like, missed up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, it's like the spatulas. Um, no, but uh, what like for them, like like the players almost don't matter. Like the players are moving through. Like nobody knows who the players are for the most part. So you have to make it about the experience. So yeah, here in right. San Jose, the local one, uh, most of the parks I've gotten to have at least one or two local beers because they're like, hey, someone's gonna come for the beer. Someone's gonna come to see their friends. Someone's gonna come to see prospects. Like we need to like make this an event. They have like th like things where like people are uh, chipping golf balls uh into buckets in between innings they had a really cool one here in san jose where they brought out an old truck and whoever could like destroy the truck more with with baseballs in, the, in between innings <laughs> would like win something nice. or like whoever could like hit the light bulbs out of the truck or whatever so like you know they just know that it's an experience and it's not always about the baseball it's like just like a fun place to go um and i think that more and more teams are realizing especially if you look at San Diego, Seattle, places that have had sometimes bad teams, they're like, hey, you know, we should have great beer, great food, a place for the kids to go play. They have bouncy houses in San Diego. They have like, you know what I mean? Like they, they, they've thought about this as an experience, much like a minor league team. And that's why if you look at it, I think the worst places for beer in America are the legacy stadiums that always sell out no matter how good the stadium is. So the worst places for beer in America are Wrigley, Yankee Stadium, Fenway, like, uh, like the only really legacy they just don't need it. <laughs> they don't need it. Like, actually, Baltimore, I think, is on the better end given its status as Camden Yards is like a place you should go, yeah. right? Yeah, but it They've also done a has the absolute decent job. ever assembled right now, so, right. They, need <laughs> so they, they need more <laughs> better beer. <laughs> But um, yeah, so those are the worst. And some of the best are places that have traditionally had bad teams. So I, I think my top ones were San Francisco, Seattle, San Diego, uh, surprising ones that people might not know about Kansas City, Chicago, not Wrigley, White Sox to sell. Um, those are pretty good. Um, I think Baltimore was like sort of top 10 ish. Um, you know, City Field is okay, but the problem is there is Interboro there, which is like a pretty good beer. Uh, but you, have, you don't know where it is. It's hard to find. So, um, how bad yeah. is the beer in Rogers Center? Yeah, <laughs> it was worse. On it is lips. so bad, it, and it's not <laughs> like when you go to Yankee Stadium, they at least have like three places that sell Bronx, the Bronx beer, and Bronx beer is like okay, uh, but not amazing. Uh, they could have done way better. At the Rogers Center, they didn't even do that. Like there is, there's like one local beer that they stuck in a corner somewhere, so they could be like, "Oh, you want local beer? I think it's <laughs> five <laughs> sections over, up in the outfield. I think there's one up there." And guess what? It's owned by Miller Coors or ABM. Uh, it's, it's a craft beer. In yeah, airport. it's one of those guys, you know. Which of course, uh, Yankee Stadium has too. They have a lot of Goose Island everywhere, which is like. What does Goose Island have to do with Yankee baseball? Like, why am I drinking a 312? 312 is literally the area code in Chicago. <laughs> well, the, the the connection is that Anheuser Busch has a lot of money. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, the, and, and the Yankees like money. <laughs> well, I, I will say that it is really hard. So the one reason that San Francisco is high up on the list, they have a bar connected to the stadium called uh, the public house and it is the best place to get beer anywhere attached to a stadium you can have ins and outs so you can get it and the reason that it is is because it's a bar and they don't have to have fifty thousand 
shares of whatever beer they get. You know what okay. I mean? They can yeah. sell out. It's a bar. Yeah, it has it a chalkboard. Matter. It's a chalkboard. They cross it off. You know, they actually can literally cross it off or wipe it off. Right. But if you're in the stadium and you go to like the craft beer kiosk and they're like, no, we don't have that. No, we don't have that. Like, I think people would be actually angry. Right. Yeah. So you, you have to make deals with kind of, uh, you can't, it's almost like not the prospects. You have the can't missers. You can have blue jacket in, in the stadium in uh dc but could you like aslan was outside the stadium like you like you can't bring aslan in because you have to be like okay aslan are you ready to give me you know twenty thousand barrels <laughs> like no we have 20 cases that we're willing exactly. to give you <laughs> <laughs> so there is a certain amount of like just being so big and have so many fans that you have yeah. to have these corporate arrangements i think Pretty much. Well, that's like in the in the in the Maryland area. It's uh, Flying Dog is yes, all over the dog. place in the state. Of stadiums. course, Flying Dogs at the park. Of course, <laughs> yeah. you're not going to do anything about that because they they actually probably have they have the Flying Dog section, right? They, there's a Flying Dog. Yes. Area. Think, yeah, they have like a whole like on one of the concourses. Like there's a whole <laughs> big Flying Dog painted area. I think. Right. Yeah. And that's a that's a part that people don't talk about so much. There's a, a pay to play marketing aspect. Like uh, stadiums expect uh, really low pricing or even some sort of uh, like you pay us to like Flying Dog will probably well, hopefully pay. in Maryland. It was just really good pricing because it's illegal to. Well, <laughs> to no, do no, anything. no, this is what you could do. You could say Flying Dog. We want to we want to have a Flying Dog section, but you got to pay for the banner. OK, yeah, you got to pay for the marketing. Right. And that you real estate pay. for that banner is really expensive. <laughs> right. But we'll buy the beer at market market pricing, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and Flying Dog does it because they, you know, Flying Dog is now associated with the Orioles, which the Orioles and I think <laughs> I think the Ravens now too. The, I mm -hmm. think they're uh, in it. I believe it's the same beer, and it just has different names for which stadium it's in. Like at uh, when it's at the Orioles, it's Bleacher Beer. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what they call it at the Raven Stadium. Just but it's like label. a, yeah, and it and it's a light lager, like a, you know, like a better version of Bud, Budweiser. Yeah, but like you know, Lagunitas makes daytime. Like, why don't we have crushers like that at every stadium? Like, we're not quite there yet. It, it has gotten better, and even if it's corporate and there's problems and it's uneven from stadium to stadium, I will say that, like, I'm glad I don't have to have a Miller Lite every time I go to a game now. You know, like. I'm glad that there's more options and generally when we're in airports and in these places, like beer has gotten better. Um, you know, I'll take a flying dog over, over Acro craft, but, uh, but, but we can do better, right? Like we, we could have, we could have like, you know, amazing, like 4.5% pale ales everywhere. Um, I was really impressed with the craft beer in San Diego, but at the stadium, it mm -hmm. was, um, I and mean, say stone stone has a bar inside the stadium, right? It's like a patio kind of, uh, that's no Val's point. Oh, eh, never mind. Sorry. It's changed, <laughs> changed. It changes a little bit year to year, but uh, okay. one thing that's really cool is behind home plate. Did you go to behind home plate? Yeah. Cause it was, um, it was in the high sixties, like just shy of 70. And I was uh -huh. told that people in San Diego don't like adverse weather. Um, and so there was no one at the game. So I just went down and I sat right I behind. First um, what's that? Uh, and they, I, they had first weather. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, like, yeah. it was beautiful. It was some of the best weather I've ever seen. <laughs> and, um, I was That's with cold. a guy, I, I was with a guy from, um, the software company that was putting on the, um, the conference and they had a box for us. And I was like, I want to go sit down there. So we walked down. He's like, how are you going to do that? I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to walk down and I look like I belong. And I just walked right past and went and sat in a seat. He apparently looked all nervous. They stopped him and kicked him out. <laughs> but yeah, so I was down right behind home plate because I sat a couple innings there. Yeah, and they've got like behind home plate. They used to have Ailsmith Speedway like at a game. That's crazy. Um, and then they have alternating. They have like a, a bunch of carts there that kind of alternate in and out different brands, different years. And uh, that's a cool way to keep things fresh, right? Like uh, that way you can get like a new beer at a ballpark that you haven't had before. So like I, I had a hazy from a resident 
uh, behind uh, home plate there that I'd never had before. So I was like, that's impressive, you know, to, to, to have a beer that was good. There's a hazy IPA that you never had before at the ballpark. I think um, like the beer is so associated with baseball that we should be doing a lot more of that at every stadium. Yeah, the best stadiums, are, like like I said, like the minor league team. So San Diego has beer, uh, beer fests, you know, and you can like you pay a little bit. And there's like a beer fest out in the outs, uh, uh, like past the outfield, and you you have all these beers, and then you go see a ball game. And like Seattle does that, San Francisco does that, San Diego does that, and most of the other parks don't do that. Um, Pittsburgh does it, but I don't think it's tied in with a game. They just have, um, a festival. They have a beer festival at the stadium, at the park when, yeah. when there's no game. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like their, um, craft beer there, uh, increased dramatically when Southern tier opened a location right next to the stadium. The, Cause then they had a big presence in the stadium and then it brought uh, a bunch yeah, of I other stuff it- too puts a little pressure too on the team. It's like, yeah. there's great beer right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just won't come over. Maybe I'll just watch the game on the TV over there. Cause I think they have a big whole craft beer bar at PNC park now. Yeah. That, that one was difficult to rank, uh, because, uh, I would say the Pittsburgh's, uh, beer scene, though it's good. Like it's, it doesn't get the national respect. Like, uh, like I trade beer, right? And yeah, no one's been like, you got to make sure you trade for some dancing gnome or like, you know, you got to get some Cinderlands in your life. You know, it's like, uh, it's not like, you know, like obviously like a Trillium or a tree house or something where like people are like, oh my God, like I, for here, it's like Pliny, you know, if I say yeah. I've got some Pliny in the fridge, people are like, oh, trade it to me, trade it to me. You have any Pliny in your fridge? I do. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what do you Almost want? always for like trade value. <laughs> I'll I'll send you some Sands jams for Pliny. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was um that was probably the first beer for me that um lived up to its hype. That mm-hmm. like I went through a lot of trouble to acquire it, and then when I finally was able to have some, it was just as good as I had built it up in my mind. Yeah, and it, uh. I'm I'm curious to see now they're making more of it. I'm curious to see like, how it holds up. One thing that I so with grass, one of the things we did was like sort of research how untapped ratings did based on certain factors, uh, distance from the brewery, ABV, uh, different words in the name. Um, Wait, let's pause this because I actually I, I this is something I hadn't even thought of talking to you about, but I bet you have all because this is something that I actually. Um, have a lot of opinions on and have put a lot of thought into because I think a lot of those things do weigh heavily onto um, ratings. Yeah. Um, so you can tell me if my thoughts are wrong or correct once we get back from a quick uh, sponsor break. <laughs> there are many reasons why I've chosen District East for where I purchase beer. I love the flexibility of being able to make a custom six pack or take home a crowler from one of the eight beers on tap. The friendly and knowledgeable staff do an amazing job at keeping a diverse selection on hand. You can even purchase artwork from the monthly featured artist. District East is located on Northeast Street in Frederick in the same shopping center as Family Mill and Rockwell Brewery. You can find today's beer lists on the District East Facebook page or at www.districteast.beer. I'm excited to announce our newest sponsor, Vanish Farmwoods Brewery. Vanish is a brewery and entertainment complex located on a 62-acre hops and apple farm in Luckett's, Virginia, just 20 minutes from Frederick, Maryland and Leesburg, Virginia. With over 20 beers on tap, a selection of wines and ciders, along with multiple food options, there is something for everyone. Vanish has live music on Saturdays and Sundays and a wide variety of special events. Go to VanishBeer.com for information on everything they have to offer. All right, now that... um... I sidetracked your thought. I'm going to tell you to just jump right back in and finish it. Oh, I, I thought you were going to tell me some of your thoughts first. Why don't we do that? Or do so, you don't want to be wrong? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, no, don't, I, I don't have the, I, you know, the data is not definitive like that. Don't worry. Yeah. I'm not going to say so, you're wrong well, it, It's funny. I, I once, I, I got a text message from a friend. He's actually one of um, the beer guys at a store that I, I go to. Um, 
it was he sent me a comment about an episode that he was listening to and it was just something along those lines of like i love how unafraid you are to be wrong <laughs> that's good <laughs> i replied to it i was like i'm not sure if that's a compliment yeah. but i'm just gonna go ahead and take it that way <laughs> that's funny so um yeah i uh being wrong doesn't bother me <laughs> um so i i i think that one proximity to brewery does increase the ratings mm. um by by the person doing that i think that would be the data on that's probably a little harder to compile we, so but just I, on that one just on that one uh we found that closer to the brewery was up and then it goes down as you get further away but guess what happens when you get really far away shoots back up and why because you, it's harder it's to get more coveted it's the fomo effect Yes. You traded for that beer. You're going to put a four and a half on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that, then that probably plays into like, I feel like there are. Um, so have you ever had an out? Like I'll, I'll use an out of order as an example, or even a burly Oak dream. Have you had either of those? No. So they're, they're very much like dance jams, except dance jams are hands down better, mm. but they this will. Is, this is one of the best sours I've ever had. This is the yeah, banana. They're, they're amazing. It's the it's the at this moment the best kept secret in Maryland. Although the popularity of them is skyrocketing, so, which right. is why I'm dumbfounded that they wanted to put me and my name on mm -hmm. one of the cans. <laughs> um, they and but both of those beers are routinely rated higher. So I also believe that just the brewery name bumps mm. up the rating by a couple ticks too. Yeah, we couldn't we couldn't study. That would that be harder to quantify, obviously. But, but. Here, here's one uh, way into that a little bit. So uh, we did look at uh, breweries that were acquired, um, and and distribution goes up, right? So we looked at, for example, like Ballast Point Sculpin, right? So Ballast Point Sculpin is here. It gets acquired. It goes down to here, and then it gets wide distribution, and it goes down further. Now, when it's getting the wide distribution, you could say it's, you know, it's now sitting at Safeway. It's sitting in the in the in the grocery store. It's sitting in near the near the window. It's sitting there too long. It's uh, not it's being not, handled properly anymore. It's not, it's not in the fridge, you know. Um, so you could say that there were uh, things that made the beer worse, but there was a bump almost down right away as soon as it's acquired, which I think speaks to kind of marketing and um, that feeling of like, oh, this is a, a brewery that people don't know about that I know about, or I, I worked really hard to get this beer, you know, stuff like that has less to do with how, how the beer actually tastes. So I think that that might be true. It's like if Burley Oak has that name factor, then, you know, people are like, oh, this is the best because, you know, it it's also super expensive. You have to uh, drive to yeah. the brewery to get it. It's mm -hmm. it has that that same thing where you know, like people trade for it. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't go into distribution. All those um, yeah. typical things that hype up a beer. Yeah, harder to find. So um, and but you know I that was here and just go ahead and enjoy enjoy my dance jams because oh. they're amazing. <laughs> Which one is that you're having? I went with the peach one. I didn't I didn't want to look at uh, Dan's banana hammock while we were talking. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to try uh, a little bit of the banana hammock, like you said, uh, and I'm going to treat it as a little bit of a uh, preview uh, for yours because it's got the cinnamon uh, situation in it. Um, and I'm excited to have a banana. Am I excited? I'm a little bit nervous. But uh, you know what? When he told me about that beer and showed me the label at first, my thought was, "You just you you lost me on this one." <laughs> you <laughs> maybe, went too far. It, it may, you went it too may far. Be, it may be the one. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> it, it may yeah. be. Um, this may be the one that I don't like. Uh, mm -hmm. And I love. I still. I really enjoyed that one. Wow. See, amazing, right? It's one of the few sours to me, and I'm not a big sour drinker because acid reflux, but it's one of the few sours to me that tastes exactly like it's advertised. Yeah. It really does taste exactly like a banana cream pie. It and it and it's it really still does. but it but it still also tastes like beer. Yeah. So so many of those beers are basically just diabetes inducing 
um, <laughs> fruit puree, the fruit with, purees, yeah. with with the backbone of I'm like not, one percent beer. Yeah, and, I'm not I'm not that big on the milkshake IPAs. <laughs> yeah, so, I, was about to say, I get that a lot with the milkshake IPAs. So I, that's, and I think it has a reflux a little bit too, like I, lactose. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So that's not why so I, I really, um, I, I really enjoy these beers because it, it, they, like you said, they taste one hundred percent what's advertised, um, and they, they have that sourness that a lot of fruited sours don't actually have, mm. and it just, I and mean, it's an all around great beer. Yeah, yeah, you know, I say better living through through chemistry, dude. Like, you know, some people can't stand the adjuncts, but uh, you know, it's fine. You know, you can have, I think there's still a place in my life. Like I still love like a crisp American pale ale with yeah. nothing in it. You know, that, that, that would be actually probably what I would have next after this, you know, because or an old, nice old school, uh, West coast IPA. Yeah. Just, nice. just clear the palate and do something yep. different. Uh, but there's also a place for this man. Like it's, a uh, it's, a. Uh, it's a crazy collection of tastes. Like I, I don't, I don't, the cinnamon doesn't bother me at all. It's just a part of the, uh, part of the ban banana cream pie feeling. It's perfectly balanced. Mm. So yeah, what like other a whole banana cream pie in there? Yeah. And smash <laughs> some, uh, sour beer in with it and yeah. blended it up. Yeah, they, that, they, I mean, that's basically what they did. <laughs> they, they're also um, one of the breweries that have started uh, putting beer into slushy machines. Mm. So you can also get these in slushy form. Oh, I have, I have not, what's that? These? Yeah, yeah. Dan's jams Ooh. are available in slushies. I bet that's pretty good. I have I, I have not been at to a the ball brewery park. Too. At a ballpark. Yeah, park, that would be really good at a ballpark. degree weather. Ooh. So. Um, we can dream. What, yeah. What <laughs> other kind of um, did, were were there any other co sort of correlations or metrics uh, that you looked at with untapped ratings? Uh, you know, I wonder if some of these things have changed. I just saw some stuff from Good Beer Hunting that was interesting about ABV, but we found that generally there was a fairly strong correlation between alcohol content and ratings. I um, can imagine that. Yeah. And like, I don't know if it's just like I'm drunker, so I like it better. <laughs> Everything starts to taste better three or four it's, in. Yeah, right. So I don't know uh, exactly. But also when we did that research, we're talking now probably like four or five years ago. Um, if you opened up part of why we even started beer graphs is if you used to open up like uh, top 10 leaderboards or anything at like rate beer or beer advocate, you would find like mostly double stouts. Right. Huh. Like the top That's... 10 was like all Imperial stouts. It used to be, I don't, I think the beer has changed a little bit because it used to be like only about like Hunapu and Bourbon County. And you know what I mean? Like it used to like, uh, it used to be like, what Imperial stout do you make? That was like the first question that people had almost. Um, so I wonder if that leave, if that research would be different now, unfortunately untapped turn off the uh, data. So we, we can't get oh, it anymore. You can't. Um, Every but, time a damn website or service gets big, first thing they do is cut off the API to their data. <laughs> yeah. Although yeah, I, they, wonder, I think they it, actually got acquired by a data company. So oh, did they? They, they oh, part of part of why they got acquired me. was for their. I know, but I want to I want to keep track of what I've had. See, I I actually stopped. I um, I'm not was, as good anymore. Well, it, it was mainly. Um, it was probably like six months or so into starting this podcast that a brewery asked me how I was going to approach rating beers that I didn't like. And I was like, I don't know. What do you mean? He's like, cause people are going to put more stock into the, if they see your review, I was like, well, first of all, I don't think anyone's going to care about my opinion of a beer. Uh, second of all, I hadn't thought about that. So then I stopped rating anything and then I just stopped checking in like, I logged in the beginning of this year to see my year in review last year. I checked in the four beers. Yeah. I can assure I, I you I had more different. than four different beers. Yeah. I, I, uh, I could see that being a case. And that was actually uh, somewhat of a problem in the data. Um, like there are not that many people that uh, double check in, like check in for quantity. Right. Like, yeah, I didn't really like I would check in if I had the first time I had a beer and I wouldn't like if I had a four pack, I wasn't going to check in all four. Yeah, I'm the same way. I think I have 
very few that are checked in multiple times. Yeah, and so I will. So, I, let me sh- let me share a review of this to you because people are probably sick of me hearing me talk about it. But so there's a brewery in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, that's if you don't know where Rockville is, it's what like 15 miles outside DC, Allen, or roughly. Uh, it's it's probably, probably like 30, 40 miles outside. Of okay, DC. it's it's somewhere in between Frederick and uh, DC. And last year we made a beer together named Beach Drink. And it was the first time um, a brewery put my face on the can of beer. Um, and this was the uh, review that was left on untapped for it. It was pretty good. <laughs> the strawberry didn't really pop out as much as the lemonade did. The dude on the front of the can has never been laid. <laughs> so that kind of also made me dislike untapped a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> So I found the guys. Oh, yeah. um, I found the guys. Uh, they, Instagram they dropped account. the review on you. Oh yeah, yeah. I found his. <laughs> I found his out. Instagram account. I went to his house. And they, I didn't go that far. <laughs> I, just, I posted the screenshot on Instagram, tagging him to a story, and just put both of my children. Think you should be more constructive with your criticism. <laughs> but then I, I took it down I've pretty had quickly. Sex at least twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's um anytime a brewery is telling me about how they received a bad review on something i was like well have you ever been reviewed personally because <laughs> i have <laughs> oh god i feel i feel that way about uh uh twitter and my writing yeah for sure uh and a lot of times when i go on tv i, I hear about my hair or how many times i've been <laughs> made for sure for sure even the guys on the guys on MLB Network did me a, a real dirty. Um, they had carrot top on, uh, and while they had <laughs> while they had carrot top on, they actually uh, showed a picture of him and me on the TV screen and said like, oh, said something like you know who wore it better or something. And carrot top is kind of a dick, so like he did not like it. That's not surprising. Mean, that's really not surprising. No, he's, a jerk. he's a jerk, big <laughs> he, time. <laughs> he's kind of a jerk, yeah. And like he's like this baseball right. I've never heard of what you're talking about. Of course it's me. And now like, he's all weird and lumpy weird, as a weird bodybuilder and yeah, and he's he's definitely had face surgery and stuff. He's it's like a nightmare. I don't want to end up looking like that, but I had to take it gracefully and just say, you know, I think I look more like Kenny G. <laughs> just carry a saxophone around with you. Sing uh, sing about Pirates of the Caribbean. It was my best uh, Halloween costume of all time. Nice. <laughs> I just went going around New York with a fake saxophone doing that, that song. <laughs> so one thing, uh, um, a geeky baseball thing that I wanted to ask you, I was listening to the podcast you did where you were talking about uh, the Blue Jays possibly um, using – PNC Park as their field. And you were commenting about how different it was going to be for batters and the pitchers at PNC Park. Why why is that? Um the biggest driver of uh park factors is actually weather. Um so Pittsburgh weather's horrible. Yes, and Toronto's a dome. Uh so Toronto would have been, you know, almost all the same all the time. So okay. uh heat uh, differences in heat can change uh, the pl- the flight of the the ball like by five feet, three five to three five feet, and that can be the difference between a can of corn and a, and a home run. Um, the other thing that is actually a major driver is what's called the batter's eye. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's um, basically when the batter is looking at the pitcher, uh, what's behind him. So in San Francisco, for example, we we have a, perhaps the worst batter's eye in baseball, and it's because it's metal bleachers. And in the first inning of the game, no one's sitting in them. So the sun comes and reflects the metal bleachers right into your eye. Oh. Uh, and then the ball, the ball comes out of that reflected sun and you can't see it. Um, whereas other places will have like a sort of like trash bag type or like a, a green black background that they call a batter's eye. That So the ball comes out perfectly and you see the white of the ball against that. So... Uh, those are two major drivers, and then the last driver. Because PNC Park opens to the Pittsburgh skyline from the batters. 
from home plate, right? It might be. They might. The Pittsburgh Park is actually one of the most pitcher friendly in the league. I think it's it's uh, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and San Francisco are the most pitcher friendly. Okay. Uh, and I, I bet you, if that's true, if you're looking at skyline, that's way worse. That's way worse than looking at like a solid. Yeah, because from from home plate, it's the whole open part of the stadium where it, it goes to the skyline of the city. Yeah, I hadn't even I hadn't even thought about that for for PNC. But and then the last thing is just um, how far the the walls are. Okay. But um, there's a little bit more uniformity in that these days. Uh, most parks that used to have kind of bigger dimensions have changed that. San Diego brought the walls in. New York uh, City Field brought the walls in. Like the ballparks are trending towards uniformity when it comes to uh, distance to the wall. So making it easier to knock one out. By bringing them in, also, or- uh, just um, I don't know. I think it has to do with so San Francisco is so crazy of a park for pitchers. Like you can never get a hitter to sign there, right? Because okay. the hitters like, oh, I'm gonna have a bad year here. So you have to like overpay hitters to come or trade for them. Uh, think about like Colorado, or just hire right? ones that have been really juiced up. Yeah, right. Like Barry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but or like you don't uh, like pitchers don't want to sign in, in Colorado. But if you're a team that's rebuilding, you want to be able to sign anyone. You want to that anyone has value. You know, you want to just catch value wherever it is. And so you almost want to have like a neutral park so that if it's a pitcher that has that has a good dollar sign on them, then you say, "Oh okay. yeah, come here. You, we can sign you. If it's a hitter, you can sign you." Uh, you kind of uh, you limit your options if you have an extreme ballpark like Colorado. I don't think any free agent pitcher, unless they're at the very end of their career or just just nobody else wants them, nobody's going to sign with Colorado. There's also an element for outfielders as well, and like learning how to play the outfield in a uniform park is much easier than say it used to be in Houston, right? With the big with that stupid hill in center field that made no sense. You'd have to run well, up your ACL field. out. Yeah, they had a hill in they center had field hill at the center field wall was like straight up. And nobody knew how to play it except for the Houston center fielder, basically. Yeah. Which you could say is like a home field advantage, but uh, then what if you sign a new outfielder? Like, you right. know, what, what are you saying? Like, now the outfielder's like, what am I supposed to do with this? So and then you take yeah. them to a new park and they're not used to, you know, the curvature of a wall or anything like that. That all can play into how they play the outfield. Yeah. Just like playing a ball might- every monster is different. Right, right. But that's since Fenway is just so like legendary, like that's not going to change. Yeah. yeah. But um, well, they can't now. Right. Cause I remember when, when I was touring there several years ago, they, they were pretty close to being designated as a historic landmark. Mm. And then once they got that designation, there couldn't be any changes made to the, to the stadium dimensions or something you Absolutely. could probably find ways to change the concourse like wrigley i think is a historic monument they find ways to kind of like the places where you're buying food the concourse like they can okay make it a little you know wider and try to but still that has to do with beer too man wrigley when i was i was trying to talk about why beer so bad at wrigley they said like there's no more room like if we you don't have where to like, put a, it yeah, we don't like we like most of these like great places have craft beer stands and like craft beer bars and stuff. But we just like, we're maxed out. Like this is the concourse. That's it. You know, open a bar so, on some dude's house. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure those places have better beer. <laughs> um, what what's your favorite stadium to go to? I think it is uh, San Francisco. Uh, although it, it, it's cold, it's cold, but um, it, you can hit a ball into the water. That's awesome. Uh, it looks beautiful. It has the public house attached to it. So I can go, I can get a sour from Russian River. I can get consecration in my glass and go see a baseball game. Um, they have Blind Pig from Russian River there. They have Pliny sometimes. They have. Do you, uh, is, Blind P- is Blind Pig better than Pliny? That's or like. That's like a hipster thing to say around I here. Was, I was about to say that, or is that the hipster thing to say? You, like people, people, well, people tell me that all the time, and I'm like, I don't agree. Blind pig, <laughs> blind pig is like the first uh, West Coast double IPA ever, so it's pretty bitter. 
Uh, and so I think some people do like that, like old school bitter taste. Yeah, I I love super bitter beer, so I may actually. Might, I've never had a blind pig, so I may actually like it better than. See if I can find you some and send you some. The, but, um, um, now I will wholeheartedly more like, you know, juicy and dank. Yeah. You know, anyone who thinks that focal banger is not better than heady topper is wrong, because focal banger is definitely I better. Will, than... I will agree with that one. I like focal I, banger. And it's it's in the books now. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's that's my number one park. Uh, I really like to do like San Diego though. Have you been to all of them? Mm. I'm at around twenty. I just don't as a national rider. Uh, I don't travel as much. I just kind of okay. also I've got a, a eight year old and a five year old. I just I, I don't want to I don't want to travel 150 days a year. You know yeah. I don't want to I don't want to do that. So. Which one is more pleasant to be around? Of my children, yeah. <laughs> my, of I'll course, answer, I'll answer first. I have, of course I have a it's five, the older one, dude. I a, oh, my, not for me. Really? I have a five-year-old and nine-year-old. Uh, the five-year-old is way more pleasant to be around. Really? Yeah. <laughs> my eight-year-old is in the <laughs> boys or girls. Mine are both girls. Oh, mine are both boys. I wonder if it matters. That, but actually, that probably does make a big difference. My eight-year-old boy is into Minecraft and like reading and is super mellow. Okay. Uh, well, so my my nine-year-old girl is into Minecraft, reading something called Roblox Roblox or Roblox. something. Yeah, yeah, Roblox. Um, but my five-year-old is like a he's like a pants on fire. Like he literally doesn't wear clothes. He runs around <laughs> screaming. He like, you know, he, he's like a second kid, you know. He's like always in my it's like he's like, ah, he's like. That's my five-year-old. Actually, my five-year-old's not that much more different, but she's at least nice. Oh, okay. my five-year-old's not so nice. And she's insane, so she's hilarious too. Like the things okay. that come out of her mouth are crazy. If you ask me which one is is more hilarious, I could maybe say the five-year-old is true. All right. <laughs> and I guess, like, really, what what could there's. I mean, other than obvious, like the experience might be more enjoyable, but for your type of writing and what you do, there's nothing you're going to gain from being there in person, right? Like everything. Well, I do interview players uh, when I can. Okay, but um, I mean, you do, you do a lot of work with like pitching coaches and kind of yeah, the, and numbers. I guess it's easier to do in person. But but yeah, I mean, usually I like to try and take what the numbers community is finding and like take it to the players and ask them about it. So that's uh, something I like to do. And also the players, I think the numbers community sometimes doesn't respect the players as a source of um, uh, ideas, you know, and questions about the game. They don't, they don't realize that the players are the ones applying the science. And there's a lot of times when I get into these good relationships with players where they ask me something that's just like, wow, that's so great. I need to go see if I can find it in the research. You know, like nobody's thought of this. Why, why don't we talk to you more often? Um, <laughs> I on that, Do you think that's in part because for a long time, players and coaches, basically anybody who was actually playing the game hated the numbers community. They just, they brushed them off. Like they weren't on to anything. And, and, now and I much more accepted part of the game. Well, I, and I think they were, I think they were okay to do that because I think the first wave of numbers was just to quantify how good the players were. So the first wave of numbers was like, we're going to, they had this stat called wins above replacement. They were like, we're just going to put a number on you. And like, I don't want one number on me. Yeah. And, and like, 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 I don't want this dork come around here and be like, oh, you're <laughs> only a one war player. You're, you're pretty crappy. You know, like, get out of here. But the newer data, stuff like uh, how hard did you hit the ball? Uh, how much spin did you put on the ball? What movement did you put on the ball? Not only is that more gameable, gameable between the players. So I've seen players being like, yo, I hit that one 120, you know, and like uh, other, other people being like, oh, that's awesome. You know, like. Like they, they can track those numbers and they make sense to them. Like, oh, that's another level of competition for them. Yeah. Yeah. And also it's like very understandable. I hit the ball 120 miles an hour. Like that's awesome. Like, you know, I, I understand what that means. I don't yeah. know what one win above replacement means. I don't know what that means. So that's part of it. And then the other part of it is 
Now I can use that to help you get better. So it's now I can say, right. yeah, like I, now I can say, you know, curveballs with 10 inches of drop do better than curveballs with eight. You've got about eight and a half right now. I'm your coach. Let's try to get it to 10. Let's hold your fingers this way. Do this. Think about doing this. Think about doing this. Look at the thing. Oh, it says 10. Bam, you did it. Awesome. Now the player has this good association between this number, 10 inches, and something he's done, and it helps him. He, he thinks, oh, this helps me get better. So that's been a major change in how players have, have thought of me. Like, I, I used to ask players about numbers, and, like, there's this famously Eric Hosmer, like, hated what I was asking and then started heckling me as I was talking to Billy Butler. Uh, <laughs> And, That's got to be a fun interview. <laughs> oh, man. I actually, at one point, like, stop talking and Billy Butler, I have it on recording, says, are you okay? Because uh, <laughs> they're, like, sitting behind me going, what kind of hair is that? That's no sex hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can relate to those types of criticism. <laughs> it's like your <laughs> Instagram review. And, like, it, they, they were like, sitting there like, what kind of questions? This is the worst interview ever. And I'm like, I see you there. I'm laughing with you. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was like, this isn't working. They're, they're not laughing with me. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, But since now players will ask me, like, yo, what kind of new tech have you heard about? You know, uh, what have you heard about? What, have you, what are you looking at? And I'll tell them. And, like, you know, sometimes they'll go and check it out because I told them. So uh, they, they now see the potential for the numbers to help them get better. It's not just about quantifying how good they are. It's about you know, best practices, how to get better, how to get better at playing the game. So that's definitely changed over time for sure. Are, are we at like, because to me, and when I, I said this at the beginning where the numbers are getting kind of too much for me. And I, I mean that, by like the way I mean that is there is almost too much data that it's a little bit overwhelming and I don't know what to make of all of it. I don't know what assumptions to draw from it. And I know in your job, you know, you're kind of taking it and asking players about it and that's, that's great. But as a, as a fan or, you know, as a player, what, what of this data matter? Like, what are we taking from this data now? What should we be taking? Is there anything that's like the best data to be looking at is I, I assume the data movement is kind of permanent, but what should we be taking from all of this? Yeah. I think that some of it is, um, you know, kind of like Twitter excitement and like, Oh, new, new toy excitement. They're like, Oh, yeah you know, spin rate, this, this guy's got the best spin rate. And like, you know, spin creates movement. Um, and that's the number one thing about it. So I could just tell you which curveballs have the most drop. That might be more exciting. And that might be more accessible for you to be like, okay, I get it. Yes. This curveball, this curveball drops 10 inches. This curveball drops 15 inches. I can see it. You know, I understand what you're saying. This curveball spins at 2,500 RPM. Like, what do you, like, I don't even know what that means. It's not in the air for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? It's in the air for seconds. So one curveball, like, spins five times. Another one spins five and a half. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so is that uh, all kind of like, it's just data for the sake of having data that there is, gets coming there is to that? that? Yeah, there is some of that. Because because we're marketing the game and, like, we can we have these new toys and you can put up StatCast stuff and you're watching the TV and they can do it. Yeah, and um, announcers need to have something to talk about during. Yeah, <laughs> and now we, and to and bring it's up. kind of fun too. We can we can kind of like uh, put numbers on some stuff we haven't been able to put numbers on. But like for example, like exit velocity, it's good to hit the ball harder. It's good to, at every angle. It's good to hit the ball harder. However, if you hit the ball 120 miles an hour into the ground, it's not a hit. You yeah. know, so <laughs> doesn't matter yeah. how hard you hit it if it's not if it goes straight elevation, down, it's a worm burner. So I think that we're in the early stages of the new data uh, that we've got. It's only been four or five years where we've had it around and people are chopping it up and dicing it in different ways. And I think from that, we'll get stuff that kind of rises to the top as understandable, as uh, accessible, and as stuff that we'll hear about more often. And then other stuff will kind of fall away and uh, we don't hear about it as much. And then hopefully also, as people talk about it more, they have to give a little bit of an explainer of like, okay, I'm going to say something about the spin rate, but in order for you to understand what spin rate means, I'm going to tell you that spin produces movement and this and that. Um, and then we'll all sort of learn what these things mean over time. Um, it's my job to like 
know what each of those things mean, but it's like a full-time job. I mean, it's literally a full-time job. So uh, I don't, uh, I uh, like what you're feeling, I understand it completely. Yeah. And I would just say that it's on storytellers to tell better stories, to, um, to, to, to use the data sparingly and to just be like, I'm gonna tell you the story and I'm gonna bring in, oh, it happens to be the best spin rate in baseball because and that that's good for this and this, but I'm really just telling you how awesome this curveball is, you know, uh, as opposed to just like throwing up leaderboards and overwhelming you with different data and every week there's a new data point. Um, you know, so I don't know. It, 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 to some extent, dive in as much as you like and ignore as much as you like. I think that's kind of uh, how we are. And I don't think, I mean, do you think that it's, um, oppressive like when you watch a game or is it more like on twitter and no it, it's the it's the social media kind of back and forth with it and um you, i don't even really see it so much in stories as much as you just see people say things on social media and it's like you know they'll they'll give you the leaderboard and it's like the best spin rates in baseball and it's these 10 players and they happen to be 10 players i've never even heard of am i <laughs> am i thinking they're like the best pitchers they're probably and I I don't do that, but it's like it's meat for my base, you know. I'm but, <laughs> throwing some meat out for my base. <laughs> but if, if there is some value in it in saying, you know, here are ten, you know, the ten best spin rates, and there's an improvement of this guy. I think I saw maybe you you were the I did one. Yeah, one. I did one. I think Robbie Ray was on the list, and you know, if you it, with that, if that comes like a a story down the road of like his curveball better, explaining a turnaround or you know better. Yeah, that's what that's to me what's like the more important thing that yeah. I think miss sometimes is like the context behind the numbers. Uh, yeah. And not, I had to balance that because I have like rabid followers who like follow stuff just as much as me, right? <laughs> and I like I have I have like team employees who are following me. Um and then I also have to balance that with like uh, but if I write a story, I will give the context. So Yeah, I, I think that's the important thing. The stories usually have it. It's like the stuff that you just it comes from all angles on social media and you're just like what what the hell do I do with this? Yeah, it's a good point. And even when I threw that thing out there, people were like, you know, Robbie Rice stunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, well, he only has two pitches. So. <laughs> also so, true. Are there um, are there many players that are craft beer geeks? Oh, that's oh, a great man. One. That's really interesting. Um, we've, we, uh, we lost one with Brandon Morrow, um, who was a one-time closer and was just released by the Cubs, I think this year. Um, he was, uh, he actually bought my, I had a, a base, what was it? A beer nerds guide to baseball. It was basically a, very much like my prospects article. It was just like, these are the places you have to drink before you go into the game. That's the one before this, Chris. And then okay. these, these are the places where you'll drink at the game. Um, he bought, he actually bought that one and like debated some stuff with me. And I saw it. <laughs> uh, that was pretty cool. Corey Kniebel is a, uh, he's a reliever for the brewers. He's a home brewer. Oh, cool. um, Eric Thames, um, who is the first baseman for the nationals right now. Um, I've had some beer conversations with him. He helped brew a beer with Corey Kniebel for uh, the brewers home stadium. Oh, and man. he's commented on uh, he was in Korea for a while. He's commented on uh, Korean beer um, and uh, uh, the list is not very long after that. Dan Straley, who's now in Korea, um, I'm going to send him some beer, I think, in Korea if they allow me. Um, and he samples. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's always these two. <laughs> or you know what I, I'm going to say recently is snow globes. I don't know why. I just say snow globes. <laughs> that sound you hear is snow globes. Yeah. They're they, delicate. Be, if, be gentle. If anyone says, how, how come you sniff so many snow globes? I'll, I'll just tell them my, my kids are into making snow globes. Um, uh, the, um, and then Jed Lowry uh, for the Mets. Um, we debate uh, uh, beer sometimes, so it's it's not a very long list. I mean, for for them, you know, it's mostly Budweiser in the clubhouse, and yeah, I, was say, yeah. I, yeah. I feel like out of all the pro leagues, the, the baseball would be the one, maybe hockey too, where like they enjoy beer most frequently. But I'm curious if it's craft beer. Yeah, it's it's rarely craft beer. I think there's also, and this is a, an interesting thing in craft beer as a business. Um, we don't like they are calorie conscious, right? They're athletes. So, and 
do we know <laughs> how many calories are in our beers? Like a lot. Very few. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just a we lot. know from our bellies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I don't I don't even want to venture to guess how much uh how many calories are in a dance jam. <laughs> yeah, right, because all the sugar, right? Yeah. Uh they, <laughs> What what I, I I have like ventured to think about writing about this sort of thing and and talk to some people about it nutritionists they do think that for the most part um, alcohol is the biggest uh, portion and I and I have some evidence for that the the non alcoholic breweries that are coming out um, there's one out here um, that had a non alcoholic pastry stout it was literally called a pastry stout which I thought was hilarious um, yeah. and a non alcoholic pastry stout had seventy five calories. Wow. So I think that's what you add. So, and then a normal, like a Guinness, for example, a Guinness. 95, only average, right? Yeah. It's only around a hundred. Yeah. So I would say that like a 12 ounce can of pastry stout, I'm doing some basic math here, about 175, which is, is bad, but it's maybe not as mad as we thought. But then you think about, well, did you have the bomber? Yeah. <laughs> did you drink a whole crowler of it? Yeah, did you drink a whole crowler <laughs> of it? Because then you're doing 175, 175, yeah. 175, 175. That Have you seen bitter. um <laughs> Evil Genius's hard seltzers? Uh-uh. So they're making pastry seltzers that oh. are that they call evil water. Um, yeah, I think it's count yeah. like completely counter productive to what that, seltzers are supposed to one? be. <laughs> have you had one? No, no, I have not. <laughs> will you have one? No, I will not. Oh, I'll even try. I mean, if you know, I was somewhere, so it just come up with the weirdest ideas. If if I was somewhere and they had one, I would feel obligated to try one. Um, I won't be seeking one out. <laughs> we'll have one of those for the three of us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll find a fourth to split it with. Yeah, you, and we'll drink Sorry. it virtually, and it'll be on your desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What like about, um which player has been the most fun to have a beer with? Oh, have you had a beer with a player? Because that can be frowned upon too. Only one. Uh, Only one player ever. Yeah, yeah I don't really. I, like, I'm gonna frat, they're gonna fraternize with the dork. No, that's true. Um, <laughs> they're probably worried worried that they're gonna tell you something that's. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I drank with John Jaso. I don't know if you guys know him. Yeah, I, I think know. he was a pirate. First baseman. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was a, a ray and a pirate and a. a uh, so it's because he it was, was a interesting. Dork dude. So I'm going to tell the story. I'll tell <laughs> the story. Um, I don't usually do it uh, in uh, a place that's recorded. Like no, this. no this one listens like to a, this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We went to a place called Twin Peaks. I don't know. Have you ever heard of Twin Peaks? It's yeah, basically it's Florida. It's a knockoff of like a of a Hooters, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Twin Twin Peaks. I was with um, my girlfriend. We did not like it for what it's worth. <laughs> What's that? I was with my girlfriend and we did not like it. Yeah, yeah, right. I did not like it. Anyway, um, we go on St. Patrick's Day. Um, and there's nobody there because why would you go to Twin Peaks on St. Patrick's Day? Anyway, um, we we're there. We're the only people there. We show up and every woman who's working there comes over to see us when we first get in there. And I'm like, Oh, this is what it's like to be a ball player. <laughs> um, and so we sit down and we're uh, we're we're uh, we're drinking, and he and Jordano Ventura, uh, rest in peace, is pitching, and he's throwing ninety seven, and Jaso can't keep his eyes off of it. And he's just like easy cheese, easy cheese. And I'm like, I'm drinking with the player, and I'm like, uh, do you ever say anything weird at the plate to the, the guy who's batting? <laughs> like, I'm like trying to talk to him about inside baseball stuff, and he's like, man, that's easy cheese. Um, and so we get to the end of the meal and, um, there's like two other writers and him and we, we all like the writers all like kind of alligator arm for our, for our wallets. And we're all like, oh. <laughs> and then Jason's like, I've never heard that up. term before. That's hilarious. <laughs> He's like, shut the hell up. I'm a baseball player. I'm going to play. And we actually still make enough noise where he gets up and he goes over to the register to pay. And he's just like, fuck y'all. I'm going to pay. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm like looking over him at the register and again every woman who works there flocks to the register and one woman is not getting the attention she wants <laughs> and so 
I crap you not, she gets on her, she does like a handstand and puts her butt up at his face and twerks upside down. <laughs> We're not at a, it's not a, it's not like that kind of establishment. We're at like a wings place, you know? And she's twerking upside down. <laughs> the, the, the last, the last little bit about this was I do these meetups where we, we hang out. We did like we used to in the, in the before times where we hang out and before drink and, and, and talk about baseball and have beers together. I do these like craft beer baseball meetups. Right. And I'm telling this story to a bunch of dudes. And um, at the end of it, I say, and I was like, at the end of it, I say that I look at this happening. And I'm like, that will never happen for me. That will <laughs> never happen for me. And there's a little bit of silence. And uh, one person says, well, I'll twerk upside down if you tell me what to do with my fantasy team. <laughs> Did you take him up on it? Uh, no, no, no. Tell me who you want to draw. What is it? I just, <laughs> just tell me what's going on. <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. But uh, so yeah, not not otherwise. I think I would love to, to have a beer with Jeff Samarja. Him and I don't agree on anything, um, <laughs> but he's always been uh, very nice to me, and um, uh, we have uh, interesting conversations where uh, we are discussing important things in a funny way. So I think we like it'd almost be worth recording. I think me and Mr. Samarja have a beer. Who's the retired player you'd most want to have a beer with? Uh, just Pedro Martinez because I I just want to I would like run in through all his grips and ask him about pitching and I just I've talked to him a couple times and I'm just like there's so much more we could talk about I just he's Pedro was amazing. Do you have a team? Yeah, me too. Like, is there a, is there a team you're a fan of that you root for, or do you just like the sport in general? Uh, well, so working kind of takes that out of you, but um, yeah. Uh, I have an interesting backstory. So I, I'm German Jamaican American. I came here in uh, 86 to Atlanta and I was in Atlanta from like 87 to 94. So like I saw. Oh, so that. you were there whenever the, whenever the Braves ruined the pirates. Yes. I saw, I like, <laughs> I, I remember <laughs> one of my very first, like very intense memories was Sid Bream uh, as a brave running around third uh, and sliding into home and like beating the Barry Bonds uh, Pirates um, in like game five or something. Yeah. Of the and then they were broken for two decades. Yeah. That, that kind of broke them because like Barry left the next year and all that stuff. But both um, Barry and Bonilla left. Yeah. But um, I, so I, uh, I, so I was a Braves fan and I, and that's when I, but, I also was like a, a, I traded cards and I, and I like knew that like I saw things a little bit differently because I would just trade um, like, I'd be like, there's this guy, Mark Lenke, terrible second baseman for them. Jeff Blauser. I would just trade whoever people liked that were Braves. And I'd be like, give me that Barry Bonds rookie. You hate Barry Bonds. Give me that rookie card. And so already I like had this like way like, Oh, fandom is something I can manipulate. Um <laughs> And so I wasn't like uh, I wasn't like diehard Braves. And then I went to boarding school in Boston. Boston Red Sox had never won a World Series. So I was like, hey, I don't have any money to buy like a TV package or anything. Like, I'm just gonna watch the Red Sox. And um, then 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 they won it all. And I was like, wow, that was fun. Um, and then <laughs> and my dad like divorced my mom, moved out to San Francisco, and I went to to Stanford. I went to school out there. And I arrived in 97 and I was like, okay, giant. And then 2002, they go to the World Series. I'm like, yeah, baby, that was fun. And then so, uh, I moved to New York. teams tried to get you to move to their city? Yeah, <laughs> I moved to New York and I'm like, ask ah, the Yankees. Like, I'm not a Yankees fan, Mets fan. And I'm in New York from 2002 to 2010. World Series, baby. <laughs> So uh, I, it hasn't worked yet for the A's uh, since I've been back. Um, <laughs> I'm back out here on the on the West Coast again. Uh, but I've always had a little bit more fluid fandom where um, I'll just be a fan of the local team where yeah. I live. You know? you're, uh, you're, you have one of the few people who have the ability to get into a stadium right now. And I, how... I went for the first time on, on Tuesday. 
How weird is that? Was that an Oakland game? Yeah, I went to Oakland. Oakland is empty often anyway. Yeah, I was going to say, that doesn't feel that much different if it's Oakland. But, like, we're still talking about 2,500, 3,000 people. Like, that's not nothing. You know, when they're not there, you're like, this is weird. Um, I don't know if I'm going to go back. I don't know if I'm going to go back. It's, um, it's, I wouldn't say that it's a good feeling. I know that people were jealous of me uh, for being one of the very few people to see live baseball. But um, the music seems so loud without people there. Everything reverberates. It makes it, it, it has this feeling of like a desperate carnival. Like we're all just trying to, <laughs> like you're just like, everyone's just trying to pretend things are normal. It feels very <laughs> pretend. It like, I almost had trouble like watching the game because I was like, this isn't real. Like this, this must be like an exhibition game or something. Um, have, and have, uh, I wouldn't blame a player at all if they told me that they, they're having a hard time getting up for it. Well, it's, so I was going to say, have, have players express yeah. that it's harder to, to probably even care maybe to play <laughs> to no one. I, I, I have asked in the ones, the players that answer my text messages, they say, no, once I'm locked in, I'm trying to beat them. Once the, once the stats count, like I'm trying to beat them, but being in there, I was like, this is weird. This is super weird. And there's something like you have to be masked, right? When you go in. Um, I'm not saying, I, I think we should all wear masks and I'm not saying that people shouldn't wear masks, but I think that there are consequences of wearing a mask. Uh, it, um, you, you might ignore someone. You might not say hi. You know, you kind of, you kind of like just do your thing. You're just like, okay. It's not like nobody can see you, but you almost act that way. We're like, everyone's just like, I'm going to go to my place and do my thing. And I got my mask on and, you know, and then when I'm going, I'm there doing the interviews with players and stuff, it's on zoom. So I can do that at home. Yeah. And I'll be more comfortable and I'll be sitting in my desk and not having a mask on. I might actually interact with the players better so they can see my face and my, the way I acting as opposed to like, so in the game today, you know, you know, it just feels, uh, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel good. I, I, I was, I went to, I went to just see if it was worth going and I'm not sure I'm going to go again. Do you think it's even going to last? That was going to be my question. Do you think they're going to make it a whole through all the games? I mean, no, they're not, they already said that they're not going to do all the games. Okay. Um, they I mean, they I think like the, the Marlins have kind of proved that this yeah. probably is not. An and now the Phillies. I have a theory. Should baseball have even bothered in involving the Florida teams, the seats <laughs> <laughs> with the hot spots and stuff? With um, Florida clearly showed they're not responsible enough to handle this. Flo- Florida man is a thing any, for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> is baseball any different without the Rays and the Marlins? <laughs> Well, I think the Rays might win at all, but um, no, I, I, you know, I was kind of more of a, a, a fan of like the the hot the uh, bubble idea, and I think that you've seen with the NBA and the NHL that the bubble is working better. The problem is that uh, baseball has bigger rosters, um, and it's an outdoor sport, uh, so uh, like doing it in Arizona would have been like 120 degrees. Um, they would have had to have like games at 8 a.m. and games at 9 p.m. or something. I don't know, and, and then the the tv deals TV aren't would be bad. And... yeah 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 so um i think one thing that did come out of this is now they're like oh you have to wear a surgical mask you have to do this you have to do this you can't leave the hotel um those are things that should have been in place in the first place but i'm not sure that the players union is very strong in baseball right so they're the strongest one right they're the strongest of one the... so when they said bubble the players said no and they were like okay i guess not um <laughs> and i'm sure at some point they said Hey, stay in your hotel. And they were like, if we want. And they're like, <laughs> okay. Um, and so now they're like, well, if you don't stay in your hotel, we won't have a season. And so m- there's a chance that this will scare people straight and do some good uh, by happening early and showing them this is what will happen if you don't do it right. Uh, because there are some reports that they like went out to a strip club and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know if it's true, yeah. but – I would say that it's probably true that they could have been more uh, on top of their business when it comes to hand washing or mask wearing or distancing. Um, And so hopefully now, like you're seeing more teams stagger workouts so that different players groups are playing together. 
so that you don't lose your entire starting rotation at the same time, or you don't lose your entire bullpen or something like that. Um, Probably smart. <laughs> should have been done from the yeah. beginning. A lot it's of stuff kind of like done mini bubbles within the team. Exactly. Exactly. I think, I think that'll help. Um, I think that they won't all play 60. I think there probably will be another breakout. Um, and I also think that the baseball owners only wanted to get enough regular season to have playoffs. That's all they wanted because okay. the money, the money nut is the playoffs. They wanted to get to the playoffs. And uh, you saw that in their interactions with the players union when they were trying to negotiate a return to business. The, the owners kept saying fewer games and the players kept saying more games. So, you know, we knew this was an issue from the beginning. And they're just going to try and limp through this and get to the playoffs is all I can come up with. So is that the, is the, so much of the money in the TV deals that the fans in the stands don't even matter? That number has uh, gone down over time. The, the number that you get from the fans in the stands has gone down over time. And okay. it's generally accepted that it's down to 40%. Um, and uh, I think that's for various reasons. And I think that part of it is how the game is played. Right now, there's a lot of home runs, a lot of strikeouts, not a lot of balls in play. And home runs and strikeouts play a lot better on TV. Okay. Um, and then also they're doing variable pricing. So uh, they're pricing out people on the cheap seats, you know. Uh, if a good team's in town, all the seats are too expensive. Um, and they're just doing things that are not conducive to like getting people into the stands. And I think they've been optimizing for the TV experience for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Cause there's just so much money in those, the TV deals. I think they saw the math and we're just like, Oh, TV is going to pay Let's us go more after in the that. future. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's go after that. And like, think about a strikeout. If you watch a strikeout on TV, you can be like, oh, look at that. And then that, and then this, oh, he painted. Oh, he threw 98. If you're at the park, you're like, how hard did he throw? What, what yeah. pitch was that? <laughs> you don't what see, was that? You don't see nearly the same movement as you do on TV. No. And yet, that, it, like, it looks like, oh, that, was that a good pitch? <laughs> <laughs> you look up, oh, it's a slider. Nice. So how did you get into craft beer? What was, what was your gateway beer to craft beer? Um, you know, my kids had something to do with it. My kids introduced me to craft beer. Now, uh, so I was in New York and I was kind of into craft cocktails as a younger person. And um, then we just decided we were going to come to California and, um, and have kids. And I was just like, I can't be blasted on three cocktails and like follow this like one-year-old around, you know? Um, <laughs> So also when you like, <clears throat> if you're into craft cocktails, you have to have like milling stuff and like spices. Yeah. Yeah, there's a like, lot of uh, tools and uh, <laughs> accessories that are required. Yeah, like you, gotta a have beer, like, you just go <laughs> <laughs> done. Oh, where get drop that. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the ways in that I had were before that, like I had uh, Sierra Nevada, uh, I used to throw parties at college. I was the social manager and I would have uh, always have a keg of Sierra Nevada around um, basically for me um, and then whatever for everybody else. And um, then when I went to New York, I had for the first time a uh, Saison DuPont um, and uh, Pincus, uh, Pincus, the organic Pilsner they have. Um, so those are my three gateway beers. So okay. Sierra's kind of the old school first pale ale I ever had. And then Saison DuPont was like, oh, like, like there's a lot of flavor in this. It didn't cost that much. Um, I can just take this home and it's not high stress. And that's when I started to get into like, oh, these, all these different tastes. I love how many different tastes there are, you know, like, yeah. I think it's almost more than wine, you know, um, you know, and wine gives me more acid reflux than beer. So that was that was a lot of the decision making was like my gut, my kids, <laughs> my situation. Uh, but that's that's how I started getting into it. What is the um, most fun or best experience that your job has afforded you? Um, when I was doing the. Uh, when I was doing the, uh, when I was running October, um, we were doing events and uh, there were some sweet events. Like I went to Houston to uh, drink at this one brewery and eat Nashville hot chicken. Um, and uh, went to Chicago and had um, 
Oh man, who's that? Uh, oh, we had a uh, a comedian um, uh, and a musician, and like a three hours of beer tasting before it. Oh, it was so good. Um, I can't remember his name now, though. Um, and then, but all of that, I think, pair, uh, compares not as well to I. I covered a ALCS game between the twins and uh the a's and there were like sixty thousand people in the coliseum which normally has like two or three thousand and sunny gray is pitching against tory hunter um and he's idolized tory hunter growing up and sunny gray uh was sat like 93 all year had not hit 96 with his fastball at all that year hits 96 three times in a row to tory hunter and one of them is just like across the nipples and Tory Hunter looks out at him and points his bat at him. Like, I saw that. I'm going to take you deep. Like, get ready. And Sonny just blows it past him. And the whole stadium is going, Sonny, Sonny, <laughs> Sonny. And it was just like, it was like the underdog story, the A's. Uh, I went down and like held my recorder up just to get everybody yelling, Sonny, Sonny, Sonny. <laughs> um, got to, and, I, I never asked a question at press conference before. It's like my first year in the clubhouse and we're doing a press conference and nobody's asking anything about throwing 96. He hadn't thrown 96 all year. And we're about to wrap up the press conference. I'm like, Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. and they're like, all right, you, whoever you are. And I'm like, Sonny, dude, you hit 96 to Tory Hunter. Tell me about that. And he, he gave the best answer about like idolizing Tory and have seen him in the spring and trying to get him out in the spring. And he took him deep in the spring. So you want to get him out here. It was a big deal. So he reached back through 96. Great answer. Great question. We're walking out. All the other reporters are saying, you know, thank you for asking. And I'm like, who were you? <laughs> uh, and uh, so that was, that was, that was a really good feeling. Just a really good uh, collection of events, really exciting. I felt good at my job and it was early on. So I'd been a rookie and I hadn't felt that feeling yet. Yeah. And, uh, that was, that was, that was really cool. As a, as a news editor, I hope all of my reporters listen to that, that story because that's, that's the job. Like what you just said right there is, is the job of a reporter is to like notice that one little small thing looks yeah. very minor total observation. And it's one of those number things that we were talking about earlier. Um, although a more obvious piece of data, but still it's one of those very minor things and you ask about it just because you noticed it. It sucks you asked in a scrum, so everybody got that answer. So everybody gets that. <laughs> they get to put in their story too. That's true. That's true. That's true. It's why I hate covering baseball right now because we're in Zoom calls. Yeah. And that basically means that everything's a scrum. So oh, that's... you know, any story I'm working on, I almost have to like get a lot of the story ready and then jump in a bunch of Zoom calls and ask the questions. Yeah, because as soon as I start asking the questions, other people are like, "Oh, do you hear what Eno asked in that Zoom? I should do something on pitcher injury." Eno's asking in Zooms about pitcher injury, <laughs> so I actually just published while we were on air. <laughs> That's awesome. Drinking and publishing. <laughs> A lot of people um, are drinking and writing. Don't do that. <laughs> no, the, the old quote is, uh, right. "Write, drink, edit, sober." Right. That's it. That's it. <laughs> um, Alan, do you have do you have any more questions for? Uh, uh, just one, just because we're in a, a market where people care about the Orioles. Um, is there anything, anything positive for for Orioles <laughs> fans to look forward to this year? They don't um, have to call themselves the Baltimore baseball team. <laughs> yeah, I'm calling my team the Cleveland baseball team. So. <laughs> nice. Um, no, you know, I actually did a, a survey where I asked a bunch of people, uh, exhibits and stuff, um, what, uh, who this season helped and who it hurt. And a lot of people said that it hurt the Marlins and the Orioles because they're in a rebuild and the prospects aren't playing. But one person um, actually said it helped the Orioles, and their, their thought process was this. So you just got a new GM, right? You got Mike Elias. He comes over. And he's a, he's a very like data tech, you know, he, he's trying to put processes in place to, to be better in the future. Right. If you have an R and D team and you're trying to win some games, you're going to ask the R and D team to do a lot of stuff like uh, evaluate these players that are playing right now, make this team better um, without really caring about the season and with just losing the season, 
what you can do is while everyone's not playing baseball, go to all your minor league systems and in, in, install all the crap you want to install. Like he can go and install all the cameras he needs to install, install all the technology, you know, and he can, they can spend all this time thinking about like when we start up, our minor leagues are going to work like this and we're going to be totally different. We're, we're going to, we can, we can do this from scratch. We're going to start from scratch. So there is a little bit of an element of like Mike Elias gets a year to just go up into his lab with the R and D team and be like, let's think about anything. Let's think about base on the moon. If it matters, maybe it'll, maybe we'll come up with something, you know? Um, so they, they, they get to be as weird as possible and install all the structures, install all the processes they need to so that next year everything's ready to go. Um, there's something to that. Uh, but just being a rebuilding team and losing a year of being able to watch random Joes in a ball that weren't supposed to be good and see if they any good. You don't get to do that this year. So you don't right. get these pop-up guys where you're like, well, this guy was all of a sudden throwing 99 and we didn't think he was a prospect, but now he's throwing 99. You don't even know who's throwing 99. Your prospects are all, they're playing men's league. Do you know they're playing men's league? <laughs> they're playing men's league can you imagine going to your local men's league and some guys pumping 99s in i'd be like see you guys later yeah, there'd be a lot of pissed off people that are in poor shape just trying to find something to do <laughs> well i mean some of them would try to stay and stand in there and be like i gotta hit off a actual minor leaguer but it's a go uh, and playing beer hockey and alex ovechkin shows up and is exactly exactly <laughs> I just be like, all right, see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, where do people go to find you? Uh, Twitter is my most active spot. So, E N O S A R R I S on Twitter. Um, I do sandwiches on Instagram. Sandwiches, mostly sandwiches. Uh, that was so that was one of the first things <laughs> Alan said to me when I was like, "Hey, Alan, do you happen to know who Eno Saris is?" It's like, "Yeah, absolutely. He's a genius, and he loves sandwiches." <laughs> so now I, I do weird. I, I try to throw. I try to just do regular sandwiches and just throw something weird in. The weirdest um, sandwiches sometimes. Sometimes really weird. I actually made a sandwich with dragon fruit in it one time. Ooh. It was. It wasn't good. You know what? <laughs> I'm not afraid to be wrong. <laughs> I have been told that's a compliment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's awesome. no, that's, so is that's that a, spot. Is the and then same. the athletic, if you, if you uh, sign up for the athletic, it's most of the times, if, especially if you do it off of, of a, uh, one of mine, I get credit for it. Um, and uh, it's like 50% off. So we're talking about like two, three bucks uh, a month. Um I think it's worth it. And it's not just me. Like you're talking about Ken Rosenthal, Jason Stark, uh, maybe your favorite beat writer uh, for basketball and football. Like we just like, we have so many good writers. It's pretty amazing. I had my doubts about the athletic when it first started and the content there is just you. It's literally content you don't find anywhere else. Yeah. I think we did a pretty good job gathering people and it's about the bundle. It's not just like, how the it, hell did you get a blue check on? Instagram, me, a sandwich. Yeah. No, 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 dude. It's all corporate, dude. It's all corporate. It's oh, who you it? know. It's who you know. I didn't have a blue check mark on Twitter, and I had fifty thousand followers. I go to the athletic, and they're like, "Okay, let's get you a blue check mark." I'm like, "What? Can they get me a blue check mark?" I know. I don't know. <laughs> you sign up with the athletic. I don't know. Um, the it, it's yeah. I don't even do that. I have like a hundred followers on Instagram, so it's it is a little weird that I got the blue. Well, that was kind of like what I was looking at. Like I've, I've, I, I mean, I don't have a tremendous following, but it's like just shy of 8,000 and and there are accounts that have like kind of mimicked me, which is why I went for the blue, the blue check mark and I got declined. I got to find someone that knows someone. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Literally. Um, But yeah, I mean, they play at the athletic is 73. I want to see your sandwiches. Uh, (laughs) Uh, the, the play is like, if I'm willing to pay 50 cents a month for, Eno, then maybe I'm willing to pay 40 cents a month for Jason Stark and Ken Rosenthal. And, you know, so it's, it's the bundle. Okay. It's not just Jason Stark and Ken Rosenthal are worth $10 a month. Oh my God. Yeah. Why did I say less than me? Yeah. They're worth the $10. <laughs> I'm worth the one. Oh, you're, you're, you're great, you're great too, Jason Stark and, and Ken Rosenthal themselves and, are, are worth the price of admission. You know what's amazing too about working with them is they're plus plus human beings. Like 
uh, they, I've collaborated with both of them on stories and I'm like, why you could do this on your own. Um, <laughs> but they're willing to kind of spread the love around and, yeah. and promote the pieces of, of, of their coworkers. And, um, I have nothing but good things to say about them. I, those are some good looking there sandwiches. Has been, you know, I've, I've been in this business. <laughs> I've been in this business since, uh, uh, I, I switched careers in about 2010. Um, and so, it's kind of amazing to me. Like Ken and Jason have always been like, these are the gold standards and my God, I'm on a masthead with him. So what did you do before um, sports writing or baseball? I did the writing children's books. Oh, really? Did you really? You ever heard, you ever heard of, them? yeah, I edited them. You ever heard of Kumon publishing? Yes. Kumon. What are some of their books? Kumon is um, actually kind of like a learning center. Uh, okay. And I did their workbooks. And, okay. Uh, uh, but more notable was the fact that I took like two hour craps um, and read uh, <laughs> baseball blogs. And uh, <laughs> it was funny too. Is it was kind of bef- like my smartphone wasn't good enough back then, so I would um, print out like chats from Fangraphs <laughs> and BP. I would go into the bathroom with like forty pages of printer paper and just read baseball and then i would leave them in there and i i'm friends with my my old boss and one time i made a joke about that and he's like i knew what you were doing i mean i'd go in the bathroom and there'd be like a ream of baseball i i, I knew i knew I, I knew it wasn't like irritable bowel syndrome i knew what you were doing <laughs> i used to burn podcasts the cdrs before um nice. like so before you can take I- it with you yeah, like like in two thousand and two or be, like before, it was prevalent to be able to just listen oh, to yeah. everything. Uh, I want to thank you so much that, that I immensely awesome. enjoyed myself. This is a great conversation. Yeah. Um, I would I'd I'd love to have a beer with you in person someday. So if you ever find yourself out in, uh, well, I've never seen full tilt uh, in action. I you saw need to it, come out then. Eat, you'll get your slushy. Like the week before it opened. Yes. Yes. I want a slushy. <laughs> I got to get back out there. Tell farmhouse breweries in uh, Virginia are really good. Uh, Vanish. Yeah. Vanish. Yeah. And Vanish like is a couple, amazing. There's like the farmhouse. There's a, there's a farm law there. and Yeah. Van, Vanish yeah. is probably like the premier one. Uh, Harper's Ferry, also phenomenal there you one. Go. That's it. That's it. Those yeah, are those, that, those I want two. Are, those. The, those two, and the, those are like a half hour outside of Frederick. They're right by us. Nice. So um, it's a date. I, I, uh, I, and flying, well, Flying Dog probably is never going to open their tap room again. Um, but they also had beer slushies. Oh. Why do you think they're <laughs> never going to open it again? I don't think they're going to. Um, they're there's not, they're rumor, not doing there's well? just rumor no they're doing well they just i don't think the their tap room, tap room manner oh. matters to them uh, oh i could they, see that it isn't it's closed indefinitely um mm. next summer is the earliest that they said it's possible that it may reopen well they're like they're like a package play right like a package goods play like they're yeah, they're yeah, like they're way selling more your stores and they don't yeah, need the, like the amount of revenue that they made through their tap they don't need room a rest is probably room. like under a percent compared to what's sold through distribution. Like I see flying dog out here, so yeah. Um, but I'm out of beer, but I'll yep. I'll say cheers with an empty one. Uh, thank you for the great conversation. Uh, nice. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. Cheers. Uncapped is brought to you with support from McClintock Distilling, Maryland's first and only organic certified distillery. They are well known for their award-winning gin and are rapidly growing a name for themselves for their matchstick bourbon and bootjack rye whiskey that have both won double gold at international spirits competitions. You can visit them in historic downtown Frederick along Carroll Creek for tours and tastings. Go to mcclintockdistilling.com for more information.